What's up, everybody? This is Noble um, with another installation of the Lost Explorer Tech Talk show, podcast, whatever you want to call it. Um, today, um, I don't think I need to reintroduce why I'm doing this show. So I, I, I guess maybe I do. I'm doing this because the the you know, Explore program is no longer a thing, as everyone probably knows by now. And um, that's unfortunate because the Glass Explorer community was amongst some of the most talented, most enthusiastic technology um, uh, tech nerds that I had ever met. Uh, and they were, you know, a, a, an awesome community. Uh, you could have a lot of philosophical conversations. Um, we've had a few of these episodes. Uh, this is sort of winding down my test season, so season zero. And I think there's going to be two more of these uh, left. And it looks like things are, you know, things are doing okay with it. All right. Today we have Stephen Maltoni. Did I pronounce your name right? Yeah, that's that's good. I mean, I don't always pronounce the uh, the last vowel. Oh, Maltoni. Italian thing, not an Italian and American thing. Maltoni. Uh, I was trying to stay authentic. <laughs> yeah. Um, to your to your to your name. Hey, Steve. Thanks so much for for taking time out of your day. I know it's almost lunchtime for you, so uh, thanks for taking the time out of your day to to, to talk to me. All right. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Cool. Um, so I'm going to jump right into this. Uh, the, sh the, the format of this show is quite simple, right? We, we have a topic or question that, that is sort of surrounds our topic and we are going to sort of debate or just sort of agree or disagree on certain aspects of that topic. Uh, and, and then we nerd out and then that's pretty much it. Uh, but before we jump into that, uh, I want to sort of sort of jump into what you've been doing after uh, after this whole Glass Explorer shutdown. How have you been? What's um, what's what's been up? What's what's what do you what is what does post glass mean to you? You know, things have things have changed a lot since glass. Uh, well, I moved from the West Coast to the East Coast, so that was a, a big change. I think that was actually like a a serious thing in, in the glass program, just seeing the way glass was received in different areas of the country. Um, being at ground zero of San Francisco during the program was, I think, a, a different experience than a lot of explorers got a chance to uh, experience. And now being here in New York, it's like, it's still cool even when I wear my glass occasionally. It got to the point in San Francisco where glass was no longer cool. Yeah, I was met with a lot of hostility at some point. It, yeah, at different times, but regardless of the hostility, it just it was it was overdone. There were there were so many of us that it wasn't really like special or cool at any point at the end there. But it, in New York, I mean, if I walk down the street, there's still people like, "Oh my God, you've got Google Glass! I've yeah. never seen one!" And it's like it, it's it's just a totally different experience. Um, one could argue that you know the fact that it wasn't cool anymore was the path to it, the product being successful, right? If it was released publicly where anyone who wanted one could get one, do you think Glass would have been more successful? Or do you think it should have been sort of kept exclusive and niche um, as some would say it is now? I mean, they did, I guess, open it up at the end to everybody, right? There was a point when I think everyone was able to buy it but then nobody but, bought it. Yeah, I think it's really that I, I think they should have kept it very small, like the mm -hmm. only the social media group at the very beginning because it was a beta. It is a beta product, both right. hardware and software. And I think they, the, I think the success of it, the, the amount of people that were interested in it really confused Google whether it should stay a beta or whether they should push it and see how big it could get. And, right. I don't know. As a small beta, I think it would have been, it would have had less bad press. The fact that you, they gave some, they gave us some apps, then they took them away. Right. It's expected in a beta, but it's not expected in in a consumer product. All right. 
So the way um, I've been sort of you know, keenly paying attention to other new, um, you know, em emerging technologies coming out, and you know, if you take a company like Apple, uh, if you notice the uh, difference between the Apple One and the Series Two, you'll notice that they are they 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 tend to find different categories of use cases and then you know release a killer feature within those use cases right so yeah. with the apple watch um if you are you know you know into fashion for example they a lot you know, they release different versions with different bands or different you know exclusive exclusive features that makes you want to accessorize because you're into fashion if you are into you know, uh, uh, you know, home automation or, or IOT, they make it very simple with the ear pods, for example, uh, to integrate seamlessly with Siri. And that also, you know, also integrates seamlessly with your watch or uh, integrate seamlessly with your, with your phone. And the topic of today's, uh, you know, chat is fitness, right? So in the similar fashion, they double down on you know connected fitness with partnerships with Nike and and sort of you know swimming capabilities that we'll jump into it here in a little bit. But the point is they tend to test out how people are using it and then they just go full bore on those feature sets. Do you feel that well one the the obvious you know uh cur you know uh, uh softball question to you is do you feel like google did that with glass as as that was also an emerging technology at its at its time and if so you know what what do you think that killer feature was but if not what would you have liked it to be i i think that there was possibly different communities in the Glass Explorer program. There's the user community and there was the developer community. And I think the user community remained very focused on the camera. I, a lot of the conversations and talk was about how first person photos, how amazing it is to have a camera on your face and, and all of that. But in the developer community, things started, actually it was an interesting move between the, um, more like web style uh, glass API that moved more towards an Android style like uh, installed application development. So, so it seemed as though they were still searching for what glass was supposed to be throughout the program, whether it's just a quick notification coming up from your phone, which has a lot of, of value and it could be, it could be a paginated notification like what we're seeing on where, or if it's going to be an actual, installed app that's using all the sensors and everything. And I think for fitness, that's what really makes things powerful is when you start really getting things active on the display rather than just quick notifications, right? So. Right. Yeah, we, yeah. Seem, we seem to be moving today in like 2016, uh, end of summer, uh, the industry seems to be moving away from the concept, at least with head mounted displays, away from the concept of give me bite-sized bits of information um, to consume and then mm -hmm. get out of my way to more immersive experiences with yeah. you know things that we've been hearing about with you know uh, um, cast AR you know vision I'm sorry meta vision and magic leap and of course VR hololens not not to forget hololens those are things that you know you're gonna experience within you know five to thirty minutes at a time if, if or if you're playing a game maybe an hour um in one sitting versus uh a general purpose utility that you know gives you information hopefully to contextually and not just just you know random spammy notifications right yeah. the, the the challenge what do you think the challenges were like why do you think they they were they were trying and failing so hard with um sort of finding that killer feature or, or doubling down on that killer feature rather. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I think, uh, in terms of app development, like 
developers st just wanted to go further with it than than a notification. You know, it, it's uh, what I heard throughout the whole program was kind of like, why does it still have to connect to my phone? You know, right. why can't we just have this standalone device? And once it does that, it's not just a a, a view to to the notifications on your phone, but it should actually be able to do all the things your phone does. So you need to be able to use all of the sensors and, and whatnot. Right. Um, and so yeah, that, that, that is the compelling thing. Unfortunately, when sensors are active, uh, you use more battery. Yeah, battery, of course, always becomes a problem. Be becomes a problem. And when you use more, if you want to build a, hard, a piece of hardware that can sustain that use case, now you're looking at a form factor that may look a little bit more bulkier, at least with the technology available today, right? Or back in 2012 even. Um, so so this is one of those things like, you know, everything is amazing, but no one's happy. And you have to sort of find the, you know, the, the, the medium. It looks like on the Apple Watch, um, you know, they, they, they sort of move incrementally. People wanted, you know, an untethered device uh, mm -hmm. or at least one with GPS capability. The Apple Watch one did not have that. And they increase the battery capacity just to include that sensor. So if you noticed in the announcement, they um, they didn't really, you know, advertise increased battery life because you know, yeah. it, you know, they, it was a trade off, right? They had to 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 give you more battery in order to give you a feature that you were looking for. All right, so let's jump. Yeah, I think it goes back to what I was saying about the Glass program is that like as a beta, as a, a Google style test of a product, it was great. They were they were seeing what people wanted to use it for and what developers could use it for. All right. So if, if it stayed as like a small closed beta, I think it would have had a little bit more value to it, but trying to be a, a consumer product is where it gets a little bit awkward because then Google s seems like they don't know what they're trying to do with it, which right, right. they didn't because it was a beta, right? So right. it would just be nice to have everybody on the same page that this was a beta. This was a standard Google product test to see what the what the users want. And right. with that, I mean, it's kind of what you were saying with the Apple Watch, where Apple seems to listen to people and, and then add the functionality. But Google was giving this product to everybody and, and letting us all show them exactly what we were going to try to do with it. Right, so. right, right. And that's actually, you know, publicly they've made statements uh, saying that they perhaps sort of pushed the the vanity of a new thing by advertise or marketing it way too much versus sort of focusing on mm -hmm. utilities that actually help solve problems. So I they mean, ba they basically that okay. everybody wants smart glasses. I mean that's that's right. the thing is like it, they right. brought this thing to the public and everyone just went crazy for it. So right. I th I think there was it was just it was difficult to keep it locked up as a beta. Well, you know, depending on who you ask, they were, some people went crazy for it for the wrong reasons, right? Or for different reasons. Uh, some people went crazy for it because they just saw the utility being able to, you know, not have to glance at your wrist um, or, you know, at your phone and still get, you know, relevant information. And this sort of framing this in the context of fitness, you know, imagine you're going cycling and not having to, to, to sort of, you know, lift up your wrist or, you know, That's just just having something read to you, uh, you know, in real time, like your heart rate, your speed, uh, or just have something sort of, you know, a directional navigation, for example, give you information that about, you know, where you're about to turn, when you're about to turn. I but, think you know, cycling and uh, snowboarding are yeah. still two huge right. cases in, in terms Alti of... Altitude information and all that stuff. We're using a bar barometer. I think... Mm -hmm. I th I th I think I remember there was a parameter on there. So let's let's talk about today. Like, so what where what types of wearables do you use generally, and then what types of wearables do you use for fitness if if you use any? Um, you know, I've during the glass program, I I went kind of nuts supporting a lot of kickstarters, <laughs> and just oh, uh, I had, I, you know, I was kind of going a little bit crazy. Some of them never produced, some of them produced, and it wasn't quite what. <laughs> They promised and stuff like that. So I, I've slowed down a little. Can you give me that? One, Although, can you give me one or two examples of the Kickstarters that didn't really um, show up? 
I know you you backed the Neo, the 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 Thalamic Labs. Yeah, the uh, Neo. You know, those they're great. I I got two of them because I was like all about the fact that okay, I could have these two uh, gesture control devices and Google Glass and and uh, I also backed the Omate uh, smartwatch, which I remember that promised uh, LTE connectivity or or three G connectivity. So you kind of have everything with those uh, devices together. Mio, for me, uh, it's it's a little bit weak because if you have any type of arm hair, this connect the connection doesn't work, and you don't really have a very good uh, gesture uh, device there. It has to be yeah. tight to your skin. Sweat and stuff like that can kind of mess with them a little bit. It's I think it's going to be. I mean, they've proven that it is an amazing device, and it's doing. They're doing in, incredible things with it, right. controlling robots and drones and stuff. But uh, it's it's are, not. Are, are, are they really still rocking it? I know I haven't really heard much from the Mio, right? and and you're absolutely right right for the hairy people uh, yeah. amongst us. <laughs> Um, they should have probably included a um, a shaving stick or something like that. Yeah, right. A that's where it comes. Like, I don't know how many consumers are going to go shaving their arms just to. Use hey, that's it. a business model, uh, um, guys at Thalmic Labs. If you want to really put this, you know, you know, monetize this, you know, strike a deal with Gillette, and 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 sort of, you know, how like some some technology companies sort of put a um, a paperclip. Uh, inside, inside the box to help you yeah. sort of insert a SIM put card a in the phone right and yeah, yeah, put a razor in there. I, I've seen a few YouTube videos pop up of them controlling different robots and drones. They may be slowing down a little bit. I think they're trying to really, they, they, from my opinion, they they need to make business relationships. They need to be connected with VR devices, or they need to be a part of the Hololens, like uh, right. Right, platform and whatnot. Like they can't really just be by themselves. It's an additive feature by itself. It does nothing, right? Exactly. And sitting in front uh, of yeah. your MacBook with uh, gesture control just doesn't really. No, 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 no. <laughs> There's no reason to wave your hands at your laptop. So, um, well, if if you have a laptop like mine, we had a little bit of difficulty um, uh, connecting today. Uh, that's because my Mac is very old. And maybe I do need a Mio so I can like make obscene gestures at my laptop. Um, it actually requires one of the more recent uh, Mac operating systems. I don't know if you've if you've upgraded. Where you're I, at. I, yeah, that's probably part of my problem. Um, I, I've pushed it as far as it would go. Um, anyway, but I have I have a, an NFC connected ring, which was a cool Kickstarter. It it works decently uh -huh. well. Unlock my phone. Um, I, th I thought you were going to say it doesn't work because I've heard nothing. But the only NFC ring that I've seen that has gotten a lot of traction as far as users actually praising it is Nokia's um, ceramic NFC ring that they recently, in the summer 2016, they, they, they um, you know, released uh, as part of a promotion with the Olympics. So you had a lot of Olympic athletes paying uh, mm -hmm. for for things out in Rio uh, with their rings. I haven't heard anything. I know it's been productized, and anyone can just go to nfcring.com or something and buy it. Yeah. But I haven't I mean, really. Uh -huh. I have a second version that, that has a little bit uh, better connectivity, but if you really have to search for the sweet spot to, to actually get right. it to unlock your phone. And, you know, it's now with, uh, I think it's Smart Lock or whatnot, whatever Android's yeah. calling that uh, you can set up different Bluetooth devices to automatically unlock your phone. It's n not really necessary. I have my watch unlocks my phone, so. My so yeah, phone. let's 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 stick with that for a second. What is your what is the killer use case for a smart ring? Assuming you can get align the contacts right and or open hand slap a robot and let it do something. Like what is the killer use case? I think it's it's uh, automation, so you can set it up as as like an if this then that button. You can tap different NFC uh, tags and and have your phone do different things, or or have maybe turn on your lights, unlock your doors. You can do different things if you if you go all out and develop a whole NFC platform. 
for it. And is that a better experience than say voice with the echo or, or and say Wemo with just sort of um, proximity sensing and stuff like that? No, I think honestly, like I've had this one for a couple of years now and I think that it was like a lot of, a lot of wearables were, were kind of solving a problem that got solved another way somewhat quickly afterwards. And so it didn't really stick off. I think okay. that's, that's, that's an, an issue with a lot of different uh, wearables is they come out with something and then another technology comes out and just kind of puts them out of business pretty quick. So cool. um, one thing I, I am, I am wearing is a, a Garmin Vivo move watch. It's kind of like a, not so smart smartwatch. It's got the analog face and everything. I love Garmin. I don't like, um, I mean, unless you're going to sing its praises here in a second, I don't, I'm not a fan of them moving to the, to trying to be like, you know, the Apple watch and, and going too far into the general purpose consumer space, mm -hmm. because I know that they excel at one thing. Uh, and, we, and, and that is, you know, you know, specialized purpose uh, um, devices for fitness and and, yeah. and and health. And I swear by my, you know, my oldie, my OG uh, um, Garmin 910X uh, or XS, I think it's called. And that thing is a tank and, and it, I, it, it's my go to for, you know, heavy training, swimming and all that stuff. Uh, but what do you think about this Vivo Fit? So the Vivo Move basically is just a step tracker and a sleep tracker. So it's pretty much just a standard activity tracker. Um, they do have a full digital smartwatch, which I haven't tested out. So I don't really know how, how that goes. This one is, it's the reason why I went with it is because of the battery issue. This is an analog watch. The battery will last over a year. Mm -hmm. And it does connect via Bluetooth to my phone to, to automatically send the um, steps and, and sleep tracking. I mean, s steps and sleep tracking is kind of a, a weak entry level use case for wearables. And, and I think this is kind of the type of wearable that most people stop using somewhat quickly. Um, because once you know how many steps you take in a day, it's like, okay, you know, okay. it's well, not going to tell me to take the long way around to get to my office because I'm, I'm just going to go to the office like I always do. And right. You know, so, um, it's, it's interesting. I guess when we start talking about like fitness focused wearables, I, I see different categories and the, this being just specifically activity tracking and, and it's, it's interesting. I, I like to wear it because I'm an enthusiast and, and I just am, interested in in tracking that part of my life but in terms of actual value i don't know that it actually provides any true value because there's no action from it and the fact that i know i slept well last night is it's like okay i i know how i slept last night <laughs> i know if i'm tired now i didn't sleep well um it's interesting to look at trends though over a long period of time to just kind of see like oh well I tend to sleep better on weekends than during the week or whatever. You know, you can you can make some lifestyle changes when you when you know those when trends. You're informed, right? Um, yeah. But then, like, there's the other categories. Like, there's this activity tracking, just sleep and steps, pretty straightforward. Like, how, it's got to be hundreds of devices that do that stuff now. But then there's actual um, health tracking. Th these are really interesting wearables. I I've been reading quite a bit about that like uh, I, I don't personally have a need for because I don't have health issues like diabetes or whatnot but there are a lot of really interesting wearables that are just making some health issues a lot more easier a lot more easy to manage um, so these types of things are really interesting um, but what I'm most excited about are the ones the last category in my opinion is the um, true fitness or actually training um, You'll see, or you're seeing now, a lot of sports teams using true wearable devices that are tracking heart rate and maybe even some uh, information about how your muscles are working during an actual training regimen. The two companies that really stand out to me is one called Sensoria, I think is how they right. pronounce it, Sensoria, and then Athos. Athos has basically a 
shirt and pants that have all the sensors built into it with like a core unit that does all the computing and this is like you can actually get a lot of very very detailed information about how your your body is sort of responding to the training session that you're in giving, um, giving you a lot of stuff yeah yeah this is i think what will enable like athletes to kind of push themselves to the next level because they actually like as an athlete you need to know how much you've pushed yourself because you always need to push yourself beyond your capabilities in order to get get better right so yeah but, it's it seems as if at least in this market at least with the devices that we've seen within the last uh decade that a lot of the hardware um is has just been there's no revolution of of you know wearable hardware made for wearables a lot of the 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 sensors and and boards and 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 um chips within these devices were the same types of parts or innards that were in our phones, mm -hmm. uh, in our laptops, in our PCs, in our servers. And so we've just sort of repurposed their functionalities. We've miniaturized them. Mm -hmm. And what we found in, in today's, whether it's a body worn thing with a sensor attached like Athos or, you know, Sensoria's uh, solution. We're basically using um, wearables um, that uh, have parts that, that we use almost over a decade now. Where do you think, where do you think wearable hardware is going today? Or, or in, the, in the future, where, where, from today onwards, like, what do you think research labs are working on? Like, where are we going in this in this space? Well, see, so that's the thing is like we, we have these different use cases like activity, health, and and fitness training. Like, I see the the future of wearables really as replacing our smartphones because, okay. like, as we saw, our, like in the '90s, it was all about laptops and computers, but then we moved to smartphones and. I don't really use my laptop very frequently anymore. Actually, like as I'm walking around the office, I'm just using my phone pretty much all the time. I only go to my computer when I have to get onto the VPN and do stuff in our security, <laughs> security right, right, right. Network and whatnot. But um, and even that, I'm sure you can do with VPN apps. Right? Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know. Our company's a little bit tight with the BYOD uh, program, yeah. so. <laughs> Not not completely yet, but technically, yes, we could pretty much do everything on our smartphones that we used to be able to do on our laptops. That's where I see wearables is getting to the point where it is a full replacement. I've talked to a few people that are not as techie. They're not as just, I'm going to get this new smartwatch because it's the new smartwatch. But they say, why will I buy that until it replaces my phone? Right. You know, the the use case of or the, the statement that, oh, well, you don't have to take your phone out of your pocket. It's cool for techies to say that and to be like, oh yeah, look, I can just look at my wrist. But for for a true consumer, I don't think it's enough to, to sell a smartwatch. And I think when you don't need to carry your phone and you can use it the same way you would your phone, then that's where it becomes really powerful. And, and I think Apple's new AirBuds is a, is a key to that because you don't, no one's going to be comfortable with the whole like Michael Knight, Knight Rider, talk to your watch type of thing. It's, it's just much more powerful when you have an actual Bluetooth headset, which is what you'd normally use with your phone and social acceptance kind of is just right. building there, you know. So I think we need to have better headsets, better, better ways to, to communicate through voice with our wearables and and Apple gets this to the point that I was saying yes. earlier, where they're fabricating customized hardware uh, and and boards, uh, like the I think it's called the W1 or something like that in the uh, whatever the custom chip in the um, in the app ear pods or airport AirPods rather mm -hmm. um, are they're making hardware specific and and they're I haven't tried it. Uh, but I'm pretty sure 
it outperforms anything on the market today, regardless of how ugly it looks, right? So, yeah. all right, so let's jump into the 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 question of the day, and then we'll we'll sort of wind down. the The question of the day is which is better, Android Wear 2.0 or the software that powers Apple Watch uh, two, Series Two, the update. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you probably already know, if you're listening or watching this, uh, Apple released. Uh, recently released uh, their their new hardware. You can't almost the Apple Watch hardware. You can't you can't really talk about the software without you know qualifying you know some of the capabilities of the hardware because they're almost symbiotic, tightly coupled. Mm -hmm. And the same with um, well, we don't know much about what the hardware looks like on Android, right? But at Google I/O earlier this summer, they are uh, you know announced um, you know launching Android Wear 2.0. Uh, and specific to uh, uh, fitness, which is normally the low-hanging fruit when it comes to wearables, or wrist-worn wearables, uh, I was pretty impressed with some of the features uh, that were coming. So uh, the first question, I guess, is the only question about this whole t this whole um, uh, um, episode, which is, which do you think is better, qualify better, uh, and then we will talk about, you know, you know, I can sort of take a stance on the Apple side if you pick Android. I can take a stance on the Android side if you pick Apple. So which is better, Apple Watch um, platform or Android Wear 2 platform? Go. Yeah, I, I would have to stick with Android on this one mainly because of that word that you use, platform. Android Wear is a platform and there's so many different companies doing so many different things with it and with just that as being the the main thing like apple the watch right now is is cool it may be that the apple watch series 2 is the best on the market right now but then there will be three or four different android wear companies to do better in a few months you know it's just the fact that you have the, it's the classic google versus apple argument, but the fact that there is a platform for Google with a lot of manufacturers, I think, just always puts them ahead of Apple. Um, with that being said, Apple has solid hardware, always, and I'm sure I, I haven't used the watch, especially the new one. I don't know if it's even released at this point, but I, I'm sure it's really hard, like quality hardware. Um, another thing, though, is the circle. I, I I just prefer round watches, and <laughs> I think that Apple, with their like statement on statistics of being the number two money-making watch in the world, uh, let alone smartwatch, I think they're they're. they're no, they in, in, in the announcement they falsely claim that they were the number one smartwatch, which we all know is not true because Fitbit has that claim. But if you parse it. Uh, you can sort of categorize Fitbit, at least some of their leading products, as you know, fitness bands, right? Um, yeah. So there's a little bit of semantics going on. But go ahead, sorry. But I think I think they're owning the rectangle at this point. And <laughs> this is this is the Apple design. Uh, they like you were mentioning earlier. It's like a fashion statement at this point to have this rectangular Apple Watch, and I prefer. The round watch faces that we see on almost all Android Wear watches at this point. It's it's actually a very interesting thing to see that Android Wear seems to be pushing round watch faces from many different manufacturers, and Apple is just not there. So there are two. Th there, uh, let's sort of break it up, right? So there's the utility, and then there's the aesthetics, right? So yeah. on the on the aesthetics, I think you're absolutely right, and that's always been the advantage of Android-based uh, products because the business model sort of distributes, um, you know, the technology, the software out to whatever, wh whichever OEM uh, that they want to partner with or that partners with Google uh, to to release it, and by that you get choice uh, and you get your round watches. Um, uh, for people who love round watches, and actually, have even seen um, 
sleeve based Android watches, but you know, Android where specifically you have, you know, rounds round with a fat tire, flat tire, you've got fully round, you've got square watches, you've got different form factors and that's great. So yes, Apple uh, loses in that regard. But on the utility side, I would take another stance uh, and defend Apple a little bit uh, if you think, in, in some cases, right? Uh, first and foremost would be the low hanging, the, the main purpose that people, uh, the consumers have actually accepted for wearables today is health and fitness. Absolutely. And, I th and I think by and large, Apple's health app and the health kit platform just blows Android Wear and the uh, uh, Google Fit platform out of the water. Uh, mostly because, like I said before, Apple tends to find the killer feature and mm -hmm. th that, you know, it's sort of validated that, you know, its users want, Apple users want to use. And then they just go full bore. Research, yeah. uh, medical research, for example, HealthKit is leading in that regard. Being able to use the Apple Watch to uh, um, track, you know, using the sensors within the Apple Watch to track, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, health, you know, capabilities and, and people, w you know, who have even asthma, people who have problems breathing and, and sort of tying that to air quality data uh, within a municipality. Uh, you are able to sort of then sort of make correlations with this information and then uh, decide that the air quality needs to be better because more people have, you know, breathing problems. Uh, a Apple uh, recently launched the, you know, the ability to, to help you track your breathing and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, research, medical research with HealthKit is, is by far a little bit more advanced. Uh, a lot more advanced than, than Google Fits and, and makes sort of Google Fit, you know. Uh, this is kind of like a, it, it goes back to the platform versus product discussion. I mean, um, if you notice the announcement with the Watch 2, um, it seems as though core apps from Apple do a lot. I, I don't know why I would even install a third party app on my watch, you know, but on Android Wear, it's a lot of third-party apps that you're you're getting to do different things. Of course, there is Google Fit, but Google Fit is more of a platform that's storing a lot of content, and a lot of different apps can put that content into the Google Fit platform, right? So, so they both they both try to do the same. I actually sort of um, describe those the the Google Fit thing. Uh, platform as a as a bank, a secure bank for your health data, right? Mm -hmm. So if and like you said, if I'm, you know, running with separate apps and they have Google Fit information, that sort of gives me a holistic view about my health information. Uh, similarly, if I sleep with a, a device that you know gives me that data, I can sync that into into Google Fit. Apple does the same thing. Actually, Under Armour Record does the same thing. So I can take a scale um, and sort of record my weight. I can take a smart, you know, a smart water bottle and sort of sync that information to give me my hydration data uh, within Apple Health or Google Fit or even Microsoft Health, right? Or Under Armour Record. So they all they all generally do the do the same thing. It's like a bank for your information so that regardless what new watch thing app comes down the line you can do what you were talking about which is very valuable is sort of analyze trends and do something valuable with the data and obviously um, Google fit leads there I think with opening up that platform mm -hmm. for developers to do stuff with it and I, I say that because recently I've looked to um, integrating Apple Health Kit uh, with you know on the web versus on an Apple device and yeah. that one that though possible that was a you know I actually quit because it was a little too hard to, to, to wrap my head around we we're trying to build a bot and we we're trying to make it um, sort of open so that you can just sort of query data from your health 
your health kit or if you had Google mm -hmm. Fit, you just query data from that. It was not easy, um, as with okay. anything Apple. So uh, I was actually uh, really interested in the announcement that um, I'm forgetting the name of the app now, but Apple's um, hiking app. The interesting thing is uh, Google's pretty much just shut down their hiking app, which is my tracks mm -hmm. as Apple just announced theirs. <laughs> and it was kind of like, does that mean that Google is actually like several years ahead of Apple in this sense? Like they built this, this app, they got a lot of data, they had a lot of users. I would say they killed it because they put the timeline into Google maps. And so you don't necessarily need right. to start up a track on this, my tracks app. You just, you have it automatically by holding your phone with Google maps on it. So Google has actually evolved beyond having an app and now put, put it into their platform of Google maps. Whereas Apple is still pretty, I would say behind on that building a separate app. It's not part of Apple Maps. So Apple Maps is going to just stay as a navigation, a, a thing for while you're driving. And it's not a full platform about your your GPS activity. You know? That's that's a very good point. And and I'll counter that. I'll count I'll go the other way with that. Google has various platforms that it supports. And who knows why they decide to drop certain apps for whatever reason. It's actually quite annoying, right? Because I, like you said, my tracks was awesome. And some might say, yes, the fun, like you just said, the functionality rolls into Apple Maps with the timeline. But at the end of the day, my utility for Apple Maps may not be to tr check my fitness data or not I may not use that for for hiking right yeah. like I, I may want to use you know go to an interface that I associate with hiking or my fitness if I'm hiking for fitness um, to to check that and Apple I think you know is a late entrant in this space however I doubt they'll I, I don't know but they don't have a history of cutting that functionality off and then rolling it into some random other platform like Apple Maps. Uh, it just it doesn't make any really sense. No, I mean, if you think about it, if you think about it across the Google ecosystem, you have different platforms, Fit, Maps, Photos, Drive, like they all bleed into each other because while you're walking around taking photos, you're you're able to add those to, to different locations on Google Maps. You can also see all of your photos inside of Google Drive. You can also save, or you used to be able to save the maps into your Google Drive. So they have a bunch of these platforms and the the way they bleed into each other, I think starts to go into the different users. All right. Like, do you want to look at your, your maps inside of Google Fit, or do you want to look at your maps inside of Google Maps? I mean, right. I, I think that that's where the... And, and, and we, we're on, we're doing this uh, recording on Hangouts <laughs> that actually, I think there's, you can relate exactly what you're talking about where, you know, you went to a social network or a community platform called Google Plus, and if mm -hmm. you wanted to, you know, record video or broadcast video on on Google Plus, you would just click on the Hangouts tab, and it was right there. They decided to splinter that and make Hangouts its own thing, which has its advantages, right? Yeah. Uh, but then, if you want to integrate with your community, now you have to manage two things: Hangouts and community. And it's as if at Google. And I'm sorry for this becoming a Google bashing session, but I, I, I'm taking the Apple fanboy route today because you took the Google fanboy route. One huge problem is they go down that route and they, they say, no, we're making it its own thing. And then they quickly realize what, you know, the data doesn't show, which is a, Google's a big data company, that, you know what, when people record video, they may want an audience to, to help grow uh, their views and talk about whatever they're talking about, right? Um, and so then 
last week or a week before they decided to roll in communities or a social network into YouTube. Yeah. But you, you know, they were doing that before. <laughs> Why did you stop doing I, I think the relationship between YouTube and Google Plus is still, still getting worked out. It uh, just makes yeah. no sense whatsoever. <laughs> but let's yeah. let's let's put our focus that this back into separate me. separate conversations. <laughs> separate the, the 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 point is is that Google uh, uh, uses data in very interesting ways, and they try to you know uh, um, you know pull that information to help solve real problems. Unfortunately, for one reason or another, if they are not sort of if they don't validate exactly what they set out to validate or when users start using their tools for something that they didn't anticipate, mm -hmm. which is how all products should work, um, they decide to then sort of, you know, veer off and go another direction. I, I, I think that's a little dyslexic i don't i don't really i hope that what it what they're doing is building the core platforms i think as we've seen like inbox getting built on top of or as like kind of a part of gmail they're not really messing with gmail anymore they're letting it be like the core platform for mail that it it should be and hopefully they build the same with a uh, fit yeah but we we started out this conversation talking about google glass and the fact that one of the top uh, uh, features that people used or comp were compelled about was being able to broadcast uh, using Google Hangouts within yep. within the, the smart glasses. And you know, an update later, <laughs> it was as if that was never. They took away the feature. Like you, you said that yourself. I they, yeah. I think I wonder. So that's back to the beginning of like the the whole beta thing. I. I I take that as that was a test. They they definitely solved the question or answered the question of do users want video chatting on their smart right. glasses? I think the backlash to removing that hopefully was heard loud and clear. Now with a beta, why add it back in and still maintain it with all of the updates and whatnot if they already know 100% users wanted that. <laughs> so like, all right. it's not okay. a consumer product, so don't waste time putting it back in you know they had and, enough problems and, upgrading and, and devil's advocate aside for a second they tested it like you said they decided that though it was a compelling feature the hardware would overheat price uh, the 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 performance yeah. of the battery took a hit the the the, the device overheated and they didn't want to be liable to you know a bunch of glass explorers with you know, uh, uh, burns on the right side of their faces. So I, I completely get it. I, I completely get why they do it sometimes. Uh, but it goes back to Glass being a test of right. software, of users' uh, use cases, and and why people wanted different things. So like, once you know, do they want this? Yes. Okay. Well, the hardware that we have now isn't ready for that, but we we will get there because that's what we know now that they want it. Right. So take it out of the test, move on to the next test, and that's, that's I think, how a beta should be run, but they were struggling with whether it was a beta or a consumer product, and you can't continue to polish a beta as you put things in and take them out, so. All right, we've gone a little long. So last question for you <laughs> is, um, uh, is, is, is quite simple here. Uh, which do you think will succeed? Do you think Android Wear will someday make its way to a head-mounted display or a smart glasses type interface? I, I think that Google Glass was the, the beginning of many things for Google, including the merge between Chrome and Android. I think the original uh, Glass APIs was, was a, a a view of having Chrome as an operating system, like basically all of the different notification panels that we had were, were web views, HTML, like showing you different titles and descriptions of content. And then they learned, okay, we want to actually have full, fully robust Android apps. So I think, I think that they will have a, an Android slash Chrome style operating system that has a use in certain places for battery life when all you want are notifications, and then 
a use in others when you need full uh, operating systems things like Android provides. So right. I would I would guess that that's the way that they're going. It makes sense. I, I don't know what the combo will look like, but uh, that's what I would expect. Great. All right. Well, Steve, thanks so much for taking your time uh, to talk um, to talk nerd stuff today. Uh, to talk about Glass, talk about Android Wear, and to talk about Apple Watch. Thank but, you. No, no. And I hope you'll, if you know, if you find another topic that fits within the frame of Lost Explorer, um, you can come back sometime and, and we'll talk about it. Awesome. Very good. So today we talked about you know, which was better. And I don't think we got a definitive answer. Um, <laughs> we, we, we talked about Android Wear 2.0. Uh, we didn't really go I into the, the definitive answer. The, at least what I was trying to say is the, uh, it all goes back to the differences between how Google does things and how Apple does how things. Apple, ap Apple does. And, 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 and frankly, uh, when you look at some of the trade-offs that these, um, uh, these massive companies have to make based on how they see users using their products. Uh, you just, we just have to sort of, you know, keep giving feedback, uh, helping them improve on what they're doing well and helping them sort of focus on letting go of what doesn't work. Um, I personally think that the future of um, wearables, uh, whether Apple Watch wins or whether or what Apple Watch becomes, or whether uh, Android Wear will will sort of eat the earth. Um, it all depends on how, you know, the type of feedback that we use it, or or how we use these these hardware products. Personally, uh -huh. it ties in even allowed in the conversation. I mean, Samsung. Oh, oh absolutely. So <laughs> the, the I, I worry that that Samsung will just. Uh, take over the smartwatch market with their their own operating system because they've just pretty much said no to Android. The point I was, this is where I'm driving at, uh, just to wrap things up. I don't think the hardware matters. I don't think the hardware is gonna matter yeah. eventually. I think how we use the product uh, is going to inform how to build software for a thing that just listens to our emotion, listens to our activities, and uses that information to speak to us or to show us uh, uh, something visually, mm -hmm. I don't. I don't. I think where the future is going, and I, I'm a little biased because I'm, I'm a nut when it comes to this stuff. Is you know, take the screens away. I, I, I'm almost a curmudgeon when it comes to to that stuff. Don't expect me to speak to a watch because that is silly. You're yeah. never going to get a mic, that, oh, not at least not with the technology now, you're not, not going to get a, a mic that, uh, um, a use case where in order to speak, you, you have to raise your hands all the time. Um, I think having something like, you know, in your ear, uh, having something that, uh, mic technology that, um, that picks up when it's within your personal space is 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 where things are going. Or maybe it might just be a little Dragon Ball Z type thing that just sort of comfortably sits on you and doesn't fall off when you go, you know, for a run or, or go for a bike ride. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe Intel might might dominate the market, fitness connected fitness market with Recon. Um, yeah. who, who knows? And we haven't even touched upon Recon. Yeah. I it's, think it's mm -hmm. moving towards this world of of algorithms, right? Apple talked a lot about this swimming algorithm that they worked a lot on and they got a, a lot of information from all of these different swimmers that they studied. Um, and when you think about that, it's, it's really interesting to think that IBM has a lot of machine learning and, and work in that space. So they very well can come out of nowhere as well. And, and I think that the future of just computing in general, because it has to move like you're like you're saying to something that doesn't necessarily have a screen. It's right. smart enough to know what's going on around it. Right. It's I think IBM is going to be coming back too. You mean Intel, right? No, IBM. Yeah, with Watson, right? They've oh, got right, 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 right. Okay. Of, so Intel is actually making product, right? But IBM is kind of like what's coming out of Watson? What's coming out right. of all the machine learning? I've I've read articles about how 
IBM is actually one of Google's biggest competitors with machine learning and, and artificial that is, intelligence. That's a good point. I actually want to do a show just on Watson. Um, I've been, it's actually been, a, a, it's in my medium.com draft trying to aggregate all the use cases we know of today that Watson has, has but you're absolutely right. Actually, I, IBM. I, I, I almost never associate Watson with IBM for some reason. I, I just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, but they're killing it. <laughs> it's gonna. It's like the future is Cortana, Siri, Watson. Assistance. I hope that eventually Google names Google, so right. it's, it's an actual person that we talk to because that's what it is. Although, I guess their brand has right, gone right. beyond that at this point. Google cool. is an entity. <laughs> right, right, right. Oh, well, it's Google Assistant is what they're trying to brand it as, at least as a Google I.O. Yeah, that's, you'll probably name your own assistant. Right, right, right. I'm right. going to talk to an unnamed robot, right? Yeah, Alfred Pennyworth, is that's mine. <laughs> All, right. All right, well, thank you. Uh, I'm going to end the broadcast, and so right. I really appreciate it. Everyone, um, if you want to, follow more of these. You can find us on TuneIn. You can find us on Google Play. You can find us on YouTube. And it's all aggregated on Twitter. So um, awesome. on Twitter, I guess right, right, right here, right, right here when I edit things. Things are going to be edited in this general direction. Uh, and so thanks so much for t tuning in. Cool. Be kind, work hard, and you know, don't suck. <laughs>